there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Their job is to protect life. But in reality, they're angels of death. In England, Harold Shipman, a general practitioner who everyone trusts. Trust that ends in death. They say he's a good doctor, but you don't last. Lots of old ladies have died with him. In Germany, Stefan Letter leads a double life as a diligent nurse and a killer. It is a perversion, the opposite of healing. It is killing. And in the US, Michael Swango, a devilish physician who injects his patients with poison. The hunt for him leads through the whole of the US. The police just couldn't think the unthinkable. They couldn't believe that a doctor could do this. Angels of death. Their murders are among the worst crimes of all time. A small city in northwestern England. No one yet suspects that one of the worst angels of death is doing his dirty work here. His name, Harold Shipman. He treats over 3,000 patients in his practice. No one suspects that the friendly doctor has one thing in mind above all, killing. When you look at Shipman, you recognize, first of all, he's a doctor. So he's really in the most prime position to have an effect on someone's life, to be in a position to administer drugs that can take someone's life. A case of such proportions that even today, hardly anyone in England talks about it. August the 19th, 1988, Michaela Sitford is a journalist for the Manchester Evening News. She hears about a patient who has bequeathed her entire estate to her family physician. I first heard about um, Harold Shipman um, after the Manchester Evening News had had a tip-off um, that Kathleen Grundy's death was being investigated and her body had been exhumed. Um, and that Harold Shipman, her GP, was part of the investigation. So I um, went into hide. Sitford wants to know why police are investigating the Grundy case and goes looking for Shipman. Almost immediately I bumped into two old ladies and they said, oh you mean Dr Death do you? And I said, pardon? And they said, well, they say he's a good doctor but you don't last. Lots of old ladies have died with him. Dr Shipman cares mostly for old women up until they die. Now, as a GP, as someone who is a doctor who's helping, uh, we often inherently have an added level of trust because we assume this person has chosen this profession to help people. Journalist Michaela Sitford quickly learns police are investigating Dr. Shipman not only in the Grundy case, but also because of the unusually high number of deaths connected with his practice. Once we published our first article, a lot more families came forward to say that that had happened to their mothers and that families were suspicious but couldn't really believe the doctor would do such a thing. Sitford's research reveals the doctor often reports old age, heart attack or stroke as causes of death. Then he passes the death certificate on as usual. The second doctor has to be someone completely independent from a different practice or a different part of the hospital who reads the notes and says, yes, I agree that this is a natural cause of death. But these other doctors never perform their own autopsy. The people of Hyde get wind of the investigation and are rattled. Journalist Michaela Sitford also has misgivings about Shipman. At this point, I began to think, 
how could a GP, somebody who was supposed to care for his community, get away with this for so long and at such a high rate? Um, and I thought it was really important that we kept following the story and researching the story so that the people of Hyde finally knew what had really been going on in their town. Meanwhile, police suspect the doctor in 20 homicides. A doctor with over 3,000 patients, who always has a sympathetic ear, even makes house calls. A doctor people treasure. Sitford wants to speak to Dr Shipman personally and find out what he has to say about all this. He didn't want to speak to me. Um, he kind of stared at me very coldly and pushed a piece of paper across the counter towards me with the Medical Defence Union telephone number on it and said, ring this number. Shipman says nothing in response to the accusations. I'm advised to stand and let you take a photograph and then go away. Okay. And I'm sure you've had enough time to take a decent photograph. Been, uh, is, it, is it possible for you just to Thank say... You. While the doctor simply continues to practice, the police request the exhumation of his dead patients. The law in England about exhumation is quite strict. We don't want bodies being dug up for no good reason. But if the police feel there is the possibility of a crime, then they can apply to the Home Office and get a licence to exhume a body. It happens very infrequently. In the case of Dr Shipman, the authorities consent to the exhumation. Just like journalist Michaela Sitford, they hope to discover something new. On September the 1st, 1998, investigators examine 11 bodies, all patients of the general practitioner named Dr. Death. The investigators do not want to alarm anyone, and they proceed delicately. They work in the cover of night. Watching the exhumations was macabre, but it was also very emotional. Um, there was the sound of the generators and the lights piercing the darkness in the middle of the night, and you knew what they were doing at that scene. So it was very emotional to watch. The results are shocking. All the bodies contain an unusually high amount of morphine, a definitively deadly dose. The presumption, Shipman pretends to take a blood sample and secretly administers the morphine. Shipman is a very clever man. He knew how to kill, he had the ability to kill, and he had the materials to kill. And he put those three together to become a very prolific murderer. When the toxicology results showed that the women had died from an overdose of morphine, it became clear then that Shipman had killed them. Um, what we didn't know was just how many he had murdered. And above all, why Shipman continues to kill. One day after the forensics results come back, the doctor must present himself to police. Sitford gets wind of it. Together with her press team, she follows him and his attorney to the police station. And he knew this was happening, but we kept a, a distance that we couldn't hear what they were saying. Um, and he was irritated by us, understandably, I guess. And um, at one point he turned round and he faced us and said, go on then, get your shot. And he put his arms out and, and Chris Gleave took that you know, quite iconic picture of him. And it was the last picture of Shipman ever taken. Instead of simply interrogating Shipman, the police arrest him. They already have good evidence. Still, the doctor stonewalls, stating that he didn't kill the woman patient. I suggest to you that you have injected Mrs. Grundy with a fatal overdose of morphine that brought about her death. No. But an examination of Shipman's computer shows he forges patient records after the fact. 
A good detective is, is far more experienced at investigating criminals than the criminal who's committing the crime usually. So very often people who try to cover up their tracks are doing it in a way that the police can quite easily and with their own experience figure out. Initially, investigators indict Shipman on 15 counts of homicide and the forensic examinations continue. Sitford also realizes the case is taking on monstrous proportions. The police had to set up a special unit. It was a huge investigation affecting hundreds and hundreds of people in Hyde. Um, and it was a terribly upsetting time. Most of the killings took place in the homes of the victims. But a few took place at his surgery where people would come to see him and they would die in his consulting room. It's very, very unusual. Shipman keeps silent, both about the true number of murders and why he repeatedly has the urge to kill. In October of 1999, the trial begins. Meanwhile, it's clear the number of forged patient records goes into the hundreds. But only in 15 cases is the evidence sufficient for an indictment. What you really are forced to do is try to identify cases where you think you can make a very strong legal and forensic argument. Sitford is in the courtroom for the duration of the trial and remembers the homicidal physician sitting in the dock. I really don't think Shipman felt guilty or remorseful. I think he really didn't want to admit to what he'd done to himself. Um, and so he continued in his usual way, impassive, slightly arrogant um, and cold-hearted. After 57 days, the jury finds Dr. Shipman guilty on all counts. He is given life in prison. The number of people Harold Shipman killed must always be a guess. It's certainly over 200. The question is, is it 300 or 400 or 500? Later, one thing becomes clear. It was more than 15. After Shipman's conviction, investigators discover he had already killed at least 30 people as a junior physician, and more than 200 during his time as a general practitioner in the sleepy city of Hyde. On average, one murder every 10 days. If we take into account the number of people that he's believed to have murdered, which is about 250, then he's definitely probably one of the most prolific serial murderers uh, in, in, in any country's history. In 2004, the angel of death takes his fate into his own hands. Shipman hangs himself in his cell. The question why he killed so many patients will never be answered for the people of Hyde. I worked on this story every day for 18 months and I saw the impact it had on this town. And it was a very intense and emotional experience for me. And the fact is, that impact is still felt in the town, even today. Harold Shipman, a doctor that neither the small city of Hyde nor all of England will ever forget. Angels of death, human beings who play God. They desire power over life and death. He said, and I'm glad you appear to be unflappable because the whole story is very disturbing. Investigators are on their heels. How do they bring the killers to trial? Sonthofen in Algoi an idyllic town at the foothills of the German Alps and home to the angel of death, Stefan Letter. His treatment was more than just helping a few people. It was deliberate murder. As a nurse, he leads a perfect double life. Neither colleagues nor the police suspect that someone here is secretly using this job to play God. Four weeks after his first ever shift as a nurse, he had already killed the first person. And this is only the beginning of an unbelievable killing spree. Sonthofen. 
Far from the noise of the big city, people live peacefully at the foot of the Alps. Until July the 29th, 2004. Police arrest the nurse, Stefan Letter, at his home. The allegation, stealing medicines. During his arrest, Stefan Letter suddenly begins talking about numerous murders. At first, no one really knows what it's all about. He immediately confesses not only to taking the drugs, but to administering them to a number of patients and writes out a confession about all of these, these murders that he committed. So for the police, the investigation is turned upside down. Suddenly you have someone who's confessing, but you then have to go out and prove that actually what he's saying is true, not proving that what he's saying is incorrect. The police don't mention anything publicly. The crime journalist, Matthias Frank, feels that something big is turning up. I began researching right away and found an attorney named in one of these reports who had two or three joint plaintiffs. I got in touch with him very quickly. Through the attorney, Frank gets access to the hospital records. First, he wants to find out what drugs the nurse stole and what Letter's intentions were. What was on the table? A record of the drug thefts. And you knew they were narcotics and respiratory paralyzers. Drugs that normally would not have been used in those cases. Still, no one notices. The beloved nurse orders the narcotics extremely frequently. Drugs that work like fatal poison in the case of an overdose. The most prolific killers are those who are poisoners. And of course, it's in the healthcare environment, which is the last place you expect anybody to do something of this nature. Frank also discovers for one and a half years, Letter has only worked the night shift when no one will disturb him. This is all suspicious. The journalist shares his hunch with police. Then they started to check all the fatalities on his ward during his shift. It turns out that the number of deaths during letter shifts is conspicuously high. The time frame you typically see these types of poisoning cases with nurses is on that midnight shift. Why? Because doctors are typically not around. At this point, police block the flow of all information. Frank continues to investigate on his own. He contacts all the victims' families and discovers that many of them have long had doubts about their relatives' deaths. The worst nightmare was the story about the mother who was injected with poison in front of her family. It exceeds the limits of imagination. To know for sure how their relatives died, the families must consent to an exhumation. With Matthias Frank's help, they're finally able to be convinced. Police examine 43 former patients. So you're literally going back and looking at hundreds of individuals who died, both patients of his and patients that were not his, that were assumed to be natural deaths. And indeed, 28 victims show an overdosis of the stolen narcotics. It's clear, the seemingly harmless and friendly nurse is in reality an angel of death. A shocking realization, especially for the families. 
They wanted to know, did my mother, did my father die like this or from natural causes? They were all curious, even though it was very difficult, both emotionally and psychologically. Litter himself says his goal was always to help people and to free them from their suffering. His treatment was more than just helping a few people. It was deliberate murder. The German media gives Stefan Letter a name, the Angel of Death of Sonthoven. After these investigations, the police had everything they needed. So did the prosecutor who led the examination. That is, the evidence was so strong, so certain, that the case could only end with a severe punishment. Stefan Letter's double life seems to be over. For half a year, the court examines the evidence and the witness testimony. And the angel of death confesses again, portrays himself as a savior who acts out of pity. There is no trace of regret or guilt. There are numerous victims that he seemed to kill somewhat at random. They weren't just old people. They weren't just people who were in unstable condition. They weren't just diseased people. Uh, and some people were noticeable because they, they came in for minor treatments and they ended up leaving dead. Matthias Frank is present at the entire trial, together with the victims' families, all the way to the end. Even now, he cannot understand Letter. It is a perversion, the opposite of healing. It is killing. Finally, the verdict. The angel of death of Sonthofen receives life in prison. For Matthias Frank, Letter's deeds are still incomprehensible. But he hopes that thanks to his work, the like will never happen again. But there are angels of death who kill out of a pure desire for control and who repeatedly get away with it. He was gone, and we had absolutely no idea where he was. Others live among us for years, and even invoke Jesus Christ. She is a stone-cold killer. She had no remorse for these victims. Angels of death. They're among the worst criminals of all time. The US, 1997. A killer has been roaming the country for 17 years. His trick, forgery, deception, and getting away with it again and again. He is a doctor who killed his patients, but didn't just kill one or two, killed hundreds. What begins in one American state ends with a worldwide search. Michael Swango. Hundreds of FBI agents are committed to hunting this angel of death. When Dr. Swango saw us come into the room, the color drained from his face. And he said, I'm glad you appear to be unflappable because the whole story is very disturbing. How does one catch a power-hungry killer who always wraps everyone around his finger? Quincy, a cozy little town in the state of Illinois, here, the world seems a peaceful place. Until 1984, when mysterious events haunt Quincy's idyll. The city hospital calls Detective Billy Meyer for help. It's about a young doctor. The young men at work as paramedics on the ambulance had complained to their boss that they felt they were being poisoned by a co-worker, namely Michael Swanga. And so the paramedics themselves were the one that actually 
uh, brought the whole thing to the forefront. Maya is unsure. Has a plot been hatched against the new colleague? Or are the allegations true? Examinations show donuts that Swango has given to his colleagues are indeed laced with ant killer. On the basis of witness testimony and the new evidence, Detective Meyer gets a search warrant for Swango's house. He hopes to find more evidence to prove whether the charming young doctor is a poisoner. When we first got here, we noticed there were all kinds of chemicals in the kitchen cabinets which would normally contain food products. Instead, it was a whole chemistry lab full of poisons. I felt a sense of evil in the apartment. I, I felt a sense of uneasiness in the apartment. He had other objects and things in there that was weird. Insecticides, corrosive acids, powerful drugs, and syringes. The place looks more like the home of a junkie than of a doctor. This is enough evidence for Meyer to detain Swango and take a look at his past. Swango's childhood is marked by a strong interest in pain, poison, death. As a schoolboy, he already talks of becoming a doctor, a wish that will later cost hundreds of people their lives. He's really in the most prime position to have an effect on someone's life. He really enjoyed being in control. And I think the ultimate way to be in control is to decide when somebody has to die. In college and medical school, it's already apparent. The more intimacy Swango establishes with patients, the more who die. His fellow students whisper that he is the doctor with a license to kill. The result? Swango must leave the university. But he simply moves to a new state, gets his medical license, and again, mysterious fatalities pile up around him. In 1984, Swango goes back to Quincy. What we see is a clear facade of a caring doctor, someone who's there to help you. And actually, in the end, what he ended up doing was, was killing people. But even though Swango has a dark past, the only thing Detective Billy Meyer can prove is that he laced the donuts with ant killer. Swango's punishment? Two years in prison. The case seems closed. The police just couldn't think the unthinkable. They couldn't believe that a doctor could do this. And that's what stopped their understanding of what was happening. In 1987, barely out of prison, Dr. Swango forges new documents, takes a new name, and begins working again as a specialist in several US states. The number of people he secretly kills with lethal injections in the next six years is still unknown at this point. His need was entirely internal. He didn't want to be caught. He didn't want everyone to know. But he wanted the knowledge that he could kill at any time. Girlfriend, job. Swango leads a seemingly normal life. But then his girlfriend frequently gets sick. Her mother believes that Swango is poisoning her and reports the charming doctor to the American Medical Association. The FBI begins an undercover investigation. In 1994, 10 years after the poisonings in Quincy, FBI Special Agent Jim McCarthy takes over the case. What was difficult initially is these were all suspicious deaths. However, they happened in a hospital setting. So there were sick people there. Some of them were bound to die. And all the victims in our case were going to have uh, death certificates and causes of death already established. So it would be difficult to pick out who was actually murdered 
and overturn those uh, findings uh, that were already on a medical death certificate. In most investigations, when you're looking at homicide cases, you have the victims, you've done each victim's analysis, um, and then you're working towards identifying an offender. Here, we were in a position to work exactly the opposite way, which is a much more difficult way to work. Hospitals decline to exhume bodies on the basis of speculation. McCarthy searches for more evidence. He goes from hospital to hospital making inquiries. But Swango manages to escape each time, and no one thinks the Curtis doctor is dangerous. I think the real problem was getting people to understand what they were seeing and then take the appropriate action. Dr. Swango <clears throat> uh, is an evil genius, and he used his superior intellect to kill people and get away with it. McCarthy is certain that Swango is continuing to work secretly under an assumed name and to kill. But he has not one piece of evidence. Even his FBI colleagues stop taking him seriously. Now he investigates on his own. Months go by, and then a year. We had tracked him to Georgia, and we had just obtained a warrant for a minor felony of false statements. When we went to have him arrested by our agents in the Atlanta office, he was gone. And we had absolutely no idea where he was. Swango vanishes again. Then Jim McCarthy hears from an employment agency for doctors. The angel of death has applied to work in Zimbabwe. Immediately, the FBI agent and a four-man team take a flight to Africa. A hunt for evidence follows. Evidence whose purpose is to finally put Swango behind bars. We rented four by four vehicles or Jeeps and went out to the bush to where the hospital was, interviewed the staff at the hospital, gathered evidence from their records. Then the local police assisted us in, in finding the villages where the bodies of his victims had been taken for burial. And when you finally find the records that indicate Dr. Swango was in a certain area, these clues which turn into evidence now, um, it's exhilarating actually, it's exhilarating. In Africa, McCarthy finds witnesses who have survived, who testify and also allow bodies to be exhumed. Here, he finally finds the evidence that Swango's patients were poisoned. And investigators find the very same poison in Swango's house. After 17 years, the noose is tightening around Swango's neck. Jim McCarthy is close on his heels. And then Swango leaves the country. So he applied for a job in Saudi Arabia. But the catch was he had to come into the United States to get a work visa. He even tried mailing his passport to someone in the United States to get that for him, and they sent it back saying, no, you have to come here. However, when he landed at Chicago, uh, we had put a notice in, a lookout notice, and we were immediately notified. So that led to his immediate arrest. On June the 27th, 1997, airport police arrest Michael Swango. Initially, he receives a 48-month sentence for falsifying documents and fleeing the country. But this doesn't satisfy McCarthy. He wants to get Swango for the murders, too. So he requests a personal interview and hopes for a confession. Shortly before Swango's sentence is up, a judge consents to a visit. And the investigator has some serious leverage. His evidence from Africa. When Dr. Swango saw us come into the room, the color drained from his face. And he said, I knew this was going to happen. I handed him a document. It was a new extradition treaty between the United States and Zimbabwe. And as he started to read it, I said, you're about to be indicted in New York on murder or face the death penalty. He starts to put his hands up and says, I cannot do this anymore. He says, I will make a deal. If you spare me the death penalty, agree not to extradite me to Africa, I will tell you the whole story. 
And I'm glad you appear to be unflappable because the whole story is very disturbing. Jim McCarthy reckons with a great deal of things, but not with Swango's confession that his victims number over 500. It could even be thousands of patients. The angel of death himself doesn't know the precise death toll anymore. A shock for McCarthy. Ultimately, the evidence is only sufficient in the case of four murders. Then, on September the 6th, 2000, the sentence. Life in prison. A chapter that finally ends after 17 years of secret killing. Vienna, 1995. She's a dapper lady and a greedy angel of death, Elfriede Blauensteiner. Her pattern, to treat old single men to drug cocktails. The desired side effect, death. Even experts are shocked. Step by step, she started to kill. She considers herself innocent, a harmless old lady who wouldn't hurt a fly. She is a stone-cold killer. She had no remorse for these victims. A killer who taunts the police and loves the press. I'd never kill anyone. Who is really behind the widow's facade? Rossatz Arnsbach, a small town about an hour from Austria's capital of Vienna. Here, everyone knows everyone. People take care of each other. On November the 21st, 1995, the town is in a state of shock. Alois Pichler, a beloved member of the community, lies dead in his bathtub. The last person with him was his nurse and lover, a lusty, friendly widow, Elfriede Blauensteiner. Alois Pichler's nephew immediately grows suspicious. He challenges the will, according to which the sole heir is supposedly Elfrieda Blauensteiner. So he contacted the police and he said, you know what, I think my uncle's death is very suspicious and the changing of this will is coming at a very odd time. I think you should investigate. And that's exactly what happens. The nephew of the deceased puts detectives on Blauensteiner's trail. Dr. Sigrun Rosmanit is commissioned by the police to give her professional opinion about the widow. She decides whether the woman is sane or not. For it is soon clear this is not a natural death. An autopsy was performed before Pichler's funeral, and a toxic dose of anaphrenil, an antidepressant, and euglucone, a diabetic medication, was found. That raised suspicion. Pichler's doctor had never prescribed him any of the drugs. Police begin to investigate secretly in order to observe Blauensteiner in her everyday life. Then their chance. She travels to Vienna. The investigators searched the whole house for Euglucon and anaphrenil. They found nothing. No drugs, no packaging, no prescriptions. No evidence. But why would a man who suffers from neither depression nor diabetes take these powerful drugs? Elfriede Blauensteiner could be the answer. Police learn from the deceased's nephew. Pichler and Blauensteiner had met through a Lonely Hearts ad. Seeking an amiable partner, also older. A clever ploy on Blauensteiner's part the choice was Alois Pichler, retiree, single, and above all, wealthy. During the undercover investigation, Blauensteiner fritters away her inheritance on expensive jewelry and clothing. And officers discover from their observation, Blauensteiner is addicted to gambling. She needs money, a clear murder motive. This lady had two driving forces in her life, which in a sense were opposites. She was desperate 
that she had money, that she wasn't poor. And yet when she got money, she had an addiction to the casinos in Vienna. From now on, officers tap her phone and get lucky. Blauensteiner speaks to her attorney about a forged will. A will from which he expects to get a lot of money. This is enough evidence for detectives to arrest the lusty Austrian woman. Sigrun Rossmanit speaks with her, trying to break through the facade. It was a very tricky case. It was a new thing, using diabetes medication to induce a death-like condition. It was poisoning with an unusual poison. And forensic experts establish Pichler died of a heart attack. The evil angel of death must have planned the murders ahead of time. The method that she used was to drug the individual with an antidepressant drug so that they were at least sleepy and probably unconscious. She would also give them the anti-diabetic drug to lower their blood sugar and then she would cover them in wet, cold cloths and call for emergency help, but they would die soon after arriving at hospital. The interrogation begins. It becomes a game between police and the culprit. Rosmanit and the officers quickly understand how to break the woman. Clearly, she had a very big ego. She thought she was very smart. So you play to that strength. You basically compliment her on, you know, man, you did this so well. You got away with it for so long. You know, I'm really amazed. I don't think anybody else could have done this. You know, how did you do it? The strategy works. Elfriede Blauensteiner is a proud woman, proud even of such deeds. She confesses to murdering Alois Pichler. And it comes out, Pichler is not the first man she met through an advertisement. The case seems to take on proportions no one reckons with. From now on, the press only calls Blauensteiner the Black Widow. She takes the stand right at the beginning of the trial, and then something inconceivable happens. She denies all guilt before the court, revises her confession. I'd never kill anyone. Blauensteiner portrays herself as having helped, liberated the aged Alois Pichler. It's done to help. It's done for kindness. It's not a murder. It's possible that she came to believe her own lies. The accused speaks willingly and at length, but only with the press. I can't help it. But all indications are against you. Indications, my dear, indications. Here is the incontrovertible evidence. Five short days after meeting Alois Pichler, the accused already has his checkbook in her possession. Investigators also know Pichler's real will was burned. A new one favoring Blauensteiner was forged. The result? About 150,000 euros find their way into the homicidal widow's hands. The sentence? Life in prison. But investigators believe that Blauensteiner might have killed even more people. Not only in Rossatz Ansbach, in her hometown Vienna, they start looking for evidence for more victims. In Vienna, they discover two more mysterious deaths. Former boyfriends of the evil angel of death and a dead woman, her neighbor, Franziska Kurbel. Sigrun Rossmanit is sure the convicted widow is wholly of sound mind. The choice of the neighbor is no coincidence. Blauensteiner noticed that the neighbor had something valuable, checkbooks. So she started taking care of her, nourishing her, feeding her, pepping her up, so that people took notice how well she was doing. And then she started killing her, just like with all her other victims. Rosmanit helps investigators, giving them insight into the Black Widow. The police decide to open the graves and exhume the bodies. And they find the missing evidence, 
all the bodies contain the same poison as Alois Pichler. Clearly, the Black Widow has been playing foul with men for decades. She never buys the drugs at the same pharmacy. None of her victims suspects what the dapper woman is really up to. But really, this is all for show. This is all theatrics, because she is a stone-cold killer. She had no remorse for these victims. All she was interested in was their money. She kept getting away with it, and what we found ourselves with was a serial killer by the time she got caught. Once again, the evidence is overwhelming. Sigrun Rosmanit serves as an expert witness when investigators once again put the now 70-year-old woman on trial. She understands the reasons. She was indicted for two murders. Many people assumed that this was only the tip of the iceberg. As she publicly said, she wanted to get married again after her release and hoped that she would meet another sweet person like her Fritzl. So we feared that a new killing spree might start. For Rosmanit and investigators, this is an important trial. The last chance to put the Black Widow behind bars forever. Rosmanit has no doubt that they're dealing with an angel of death. It was fascinating to see how she presented herself, what she said, and how she said it, with such conviction. A layman never would have guessed how she tortured her victims, what she did to them. But the judges do see through the facade. They find Blauensteiner guilty and sentence her to life in prison. About two years later, Elfriede Blauensteiner dies of a brain tumor in prison at the age of 72. She's buried in Vienna Central Cemetery in an unmarked grave. For Sigrun Rosmanit, it was a strange case. Women rarely kill, and rarer still, old women. But Rosmanit knows Everyone has his own style. Women are different from men. When they plan crimes, they are more creative, refined. They speak less about it and act more decisively. And they are more patient. They can wait longer. So could Elfriede Blauensteiner. Four innocent people die at the Black Widow's hand. After a six-year investigation, one thing is clear. This angel of death is history forever. For Rosmanit and all of Austria, the case is closed. Angels of death. For years, they kill unnoticed and in secret, driven by lust for power, sympathy and greed. But in the end, they all pay for it. Two are serving life sentences, and two are forevermore history. <laughs>